you very much, uh, Luazi. The Honorable Minister uh, for Higher Education, Science and Technology, uh, Dr. Zimande, the members of the Ministerial Advisory Committee, Professor Abdul Karim, Reverend Umblana, and uh, Professor Shub, Deputy Minister, and all the members of the Ministerial Committees, and uh, uh, members of the uh, various provincial governments, members of the media and fellow South Africans, welcome to this evening's briefing. And uh, I'd like to start by, <clears throat> by uh, uh, thanking my uh, colleague, uh, um, Minister Nzimande, with whom we are co-hosting this particular event uh, that uh, we are here today to share some uh, very important news to uh, our country. We have convened this public briefing today to announce that uh, variants of SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus currently termed 501V2 variant has been identified by our genomics uh, scientists here in South Africa. This is a version of the COVID-19 virus that uh, the scientists wants to, want to uh, indicate to us what has happened in terms of their findings. This genomics team led by Wazul Natal Research Innovation and Sequencing Platform, which is called CRISP, has sequenced hundreds of samples from across the country since the beginning of the pandemic in March. As they will elaborate shortly, they notice that a particular variant has increasingly dominated the findings of samples collected in the past two months. In addition, clinicians have been proving, uh, providing anecdotal evidence of a shift in the clinical epidemiological picture, and in particular noting that they are seeing a larger proportion of younger patients with no comorbidities presenting with critical illness. The evidence that has been collated therefore strongly suggests that the current second wave we're experiencing is also therefore being driven by this new variant. The, the team led by uh, Professor Tulio de la Vera, uh, uh, who will also give the presentation, we, we has been sharing with the, the, these findings with uh, the WHO and uh, we have actually gone on to, they've gone on to share with some of the uh, scientists in the United Kingdom. And so uh, they found that there are similarities that they've detected at that level. As we all know that in the UK, they would actually even gone to uh, uh, report to their parliament. And uh, at this point, we believe it's very important that we share this, uh, this uh, research uh, finding to all South Africans. We have briefed uh, the president and uh, <clears throat> some of the you know, um, health stakeholders, and we will be going on to brief the rest of the uh, cabinet and the members of the National Coronavirus uh, uh, Command Council. So at this point, uh, I would like to invite my colleague, Minister Plain Zimande, Minister for, Higher, for, Minister for Higher Education, Science and Innovation, because uh, these two uh, departments collaborate on the support that is given to the institutions that are doing this work. And at this point, therefore, would like to uh, invite uh, my colleague, uh, Minister Nzimande, to make some uh, <coughs> opening remarks. At the end of the presentation, uh, Minister Nzimande will also make comments, looking at way forward. I will also do the same, responding to the issues that would have been put on the table, just to give you a sense of what is our attitude as the Department of Health when it comes to dealing with the uh, findings uh, from the um, from the research. Thank you very much, uh, my colleague um, Pepeta. Please uh, take yeah. the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister Mkise, uh, our Minister of Health, and the Deputy Minister Joe Pasha, the, the members of the Ministerial Advisory Committee for Minister Mkise, uh, as well as Tulio, who is the Director of, uh, of CRISP. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, Minister Mkise. All really that I wanted to say is to point out that this is one example of the whole of government approach and cooperation. As the Department of Science and Innovation, who have been very much part of this project through our Strategic Health Innovation Partnership, which has funded CRIPS for this project on spatial and genomic monitoring of COVID-19 cases in South Africa, which was initially funded by 10 million rands. We're very pleased to see that there is actually products in terms of uh, the spatial and genomic monitoring of COVID-19. 
and also the important role that we are playing to support your effort, Minister Mkiza, and that of all of government uh, with scientific backup uh, in terms of uh, uh, engaging and understanding this pandemic better. I don't need to say much, of course. CRISP was established in 2017 and it's situated at the University of Natal, Wazulu Natal's Nelson Mandela uh, School of Medicine, and is a cutting edge genomic center which offers a range of DNA sequencing, precision medicine testing, bioinformatics services and technologies to academic, industrial, and commercial users. And of course, in this instance, the work that they are doing is gonna be of enormous assistance to the National Coronavirus Command Council and in the work of the Department of Health in dealing with uh, COVID-19. So on our side, we're fully supportive of this initiative. And thank you very much, uh, Minister Mkize, uh, for being part of this press briefing. Thank you very much. We're going to requ uh, request uh, Professor Abdul Karim uh, to uh, start the presentation. He is also going to invite and introduce the whole team, and then we'll come back at the end. Thank you very much, Prof. If you can go ahead. Thank you very much, Minister Nzimande and Minister Mkize. It's a great honor to have this opportunity to share with you some new scientific research findings. I'm afraid we do not have good news for you, but we want to present the news in a way that enables you to understand what we are now seeing in the second wave. So I'm going to, the way we've structured this is that Professor Dolivera will start with a presentation that will share with you what we are looking at in the phylogenetics of the virus. I will do a short presentation thereafter, and then I'll hand back to Minister Mkisi. Without further ado, I'd like to call on Professor Dolivera, who is the director of the KwaZulu-Natal Sequencing Innovation uh, Platform, who will uh, do his presentation sharing with you the latest results from the viruses that have been sequenced uh, from various clinics on COVID-19. Over to you, Julio. Yeah. Thank you, Professor uh, Karim. Uh, uh, thank you, ministers. Yeah. So I will start a short presentation. Uh, we we drove this presentation to, despite being very scientific, we think that's going to be understandable by most of people in the country. Yeah? So just to start, the, the the title of the presentation is Emergence and re Very Rapid Spread of a New SARS-CoV-2 Lineage with multiple spike mutations in South Africa. As both ministers and Professor Karim has presented, my name is Tulio de Oliveira. And here I'm presenting results, not just from CRISP, the research center that I direct at, at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, but from a bigger consortium in, in the country. So just to start, yeah, genomics has been a very potent tool in the fight against COVID-19. Eh? It was used to discover the virus that caused the disease, and that was very quick, within 15 days of identifying a unusual case of pneumonia, they could sequence identify the virus that was very similar to SARS. That's why they call SARS-CoV-2. It was also used to develop our diagnostic, this means our qPCR, the tests that people do. So basically what this test does, it is to look for probes in the genes of the virus. Yeah? It was also used to develop vaccines. All the vaccines that we are currently in development and the ones that have been approved, both the mRNA and the vector vaccines, will use the genome of the virus. Eh? We really also use genomics to understand transmission, to see where the virus comes from. Also very important to control outbreaks has been showing a very good tool and to understand the spread of the virus in the country. Eh? It is also through this technology that we uh, identify reinfection and understand how our body, how the host, the human host interact with the virus. 
So this is a very big international uh, program that have produced over 250,000 genomes, which two and a half of them here in South Africa. How we set up this program, it is to do that in real time. What it means that we could keep surveying the virus in the country uh, as it happens, not as an academic exercise that you look at which virus caused the infection six months later. Yeah. So what we did, we partnered, very close partnership with the National Health Laboratory Service, the NHLS, the NICD. And then what we did is to put one genomic center close to each of the labs. Yeah. This means here in Durban, we, we do it in Cos Albert uh, Latuli Central Hospital. Yeah. And then in, in the University of the Free State, also with the NHLS based in the Pelonome Hospital, in the same with the Tigerberg and the UCT. Yeah. And this allow us to really sample widely in the country, but more important, very quick. If it just to ground you in this information here, on, on graphic panel number A, we have what you call our number of cases or what you call first wave, yeah? Uh, and here, the most important information here is these little blue dots. So these mean the genomes that we have sequenced from the virus. And we went back to the contact of the first individual and we keep surveying that during all the first wave, yeah? What we learned from the first wave, it's where the virus came from to South Africa. It was the majority was introduction was from Europe. That's not surprising given that 80% of our international air traffic outside the continent is to Europe. But what's happened is that after the introductions that now is just shown in these little black dots, yeah, it starts spreading widely in the country. Yeah? So we know that like more than 99.9% of the infections in South Africa were spreading inside the country by strains that have been introduced from outside. So just also to understand that, yeah, just what I'm showing here in, the, in this axis is the dates where the samples are collected. In the Y axis is the proportion of the genomes that identify to a given lineage. What it means, it means that normally when I have white here, I have too many lineages, too many virus circulating and not one dominating, yeah? So we have normally dozens of lineages circulating one time. And then what you happen during our lockdown, we start establishing what you call specific South African lineages and they get name in the classification. Uh, that's the international classification of SARS-CoV-2. And what we found over time is that these lineages or this virus, it was infecting around like 10, 15% of the population or individuals with these three main lineages, yeah? But what we found very recently, and that's why we are here sharing this information with you, is that as we pass our first uh, wave, yeah, some of the main lineage starts circulating, and then we have the appearance of this new lineage of the virus that very quick start dominating all the genomes that we sample. What it means, it means that when we look for the virus now, we have not finding the lineages, sometimes dozens of them or the main lineages, but now we are finding one lineage that is is starting to move around the second wave yeah, with around 90% of the sequence being dominated by this single lineage. Yeah. So what we do with that data, it allows us to understand with the genomic data, what we call phylogenetics, yeah, the origin of that, which means where it seems to have started. Yeah. Not surprising, it started uh, close to where our second wave of the infection started. This is in the Eastern Cape, close to the Nelson Mandela Bay. It's very important to know that we have no, we don't know where this virus, this lineage was created. We know where it starts spreading at very fast pace is in the Nelson Mandela Bay. And these colors here represent when the introduction happened to other areas. So if there is light blue, that was early. When we say early, that's around July, August, September in the year. And the dark colors is more recent, like around October, November, and December. So this lineage starts spreading first in the surrounding areas. It moved to the garden root, and most of you are gonna be aware of the size of the second wave in the garden root, and then started spreading also to KwaZulu-Natal. We have, so basically, 
districts following the, the coast. Yeah? In KwaZulu-Natal now we have seven of the 11 districts. We find that lineage and also to Cape Town. So we have generated from this lineage only uh, close to 200 genomes. To be honest, we, we generate a little bit more in the last few days, yeah. And they sample from the 15th of October to the 25th of November. And they come from over 50 clinics. So we are quite confident that our sampling has been quite random. And that's where the partnership with the NHLS is so important because they are the ones that select the random samples to be sequenced, yeah. One thing that we find, of course, we focus a lot in this area on the second wave because that started. Once entering safe in Cape Town, and that's just data that we're analyzing at the moment from the Tiger Bug, from the Stellenbosch University, it seemed to also dominate in Cape Town to close to 88% of the, the sequence in the Western Cape and uh, around the coast also being of that lineage. Yeah. So that is concerning how one lineage dominating this pandemic in the second wave. Just to ground you here, I have the three previous lineages of SARS-CoV-2 that circulate in South Africa. They have a number of mutations to the genome, the original genome that was identified in Wuhan, China. And this new one has more mutations, have like between 20 and 25 mutations. But what is striking, it is all these mutations, they cause amino acid changes in the proteins what it means. It means that seems that they have a functional difference, making the virus behaving is slightly different. So what we do next is to identify which proteins this virus is, it, it is changing. Yeah? And again, to ground you, that's the first uh, lineages, the main lineage circulating the first wave. They have a, one or two mutations in the key protein of the virus, and I'm gonna give you more information, but they translate to only one amino acid mutation. And that's amino acid mutation that has been uh, emerged in Europe and have shown the virus to be more transmissible. Yeah? This new lineage has seven or eight mutations and all of them change the amino acid. Yeah? And then what we go after is to see what's the effect of this change on what you call the CT score. The CT score is a technical term that comes from the testing, from the, the testing that people do in the nasal pharyngeal swab. And as low is the CT score, we, it's associated with a higher number of level in the individual. So this lineage seems to have lower CT score, suggesting that maybe has circulating at a higher level in an infected individual. So just to explain to you what is the importance of the back of this lineage and where the changes happen the protein. Here we have the virus. The virus, it will use a protein that's called a spike protein. So basically they call it spike because outside the cell, it will bind to the human receptor cell to enter in the body. So that's how the virus set infection, yeah? So not only this, this, this spike protein has eight substitutions, but what we normally worry is that where they are. And in the case, they are in the region called the receptor binding domain. And this is the main domain of the virus that the neutralizing antibodies will attack. This means how the body clear the infection and also the focus of the vaccines. So mutations there may therefore affect the binding or neutralization of the virus by individuals, yeah? If we get a close look at the virus and here is the virus, what is called the protein three-dimensional structure, that's the domain of the virus of the spike that bind to the human uh, receptor. Here is the human receptor, the ACE2 in gray. We have changes in three key amino acids. Yeah. The first one is the 501Y, which seems to en enhance the binding affinity of this virus to the receptor in the body to enter the cell. And that's exactly the same amino acid mutation that have been identified in the UK last week, which seems to also be associated with a fa fast spread of a lineage, yeah? And they end up locking down the whole London to try to, 
to curb this transmission, yeah. But this virus also have two other substitution, uh, two key residues that also binding the human protein, and that it is also probably enhanced the binding affinity, but also associated with a resistance to the natural antibodies of the of the of the body. Yeah? I know that this sounds a little bit too scientific for the public, and that's why Professor Slims Abdul Karim will follow, which we'll see what's the implications to the of this change. Yeah. So what's the next steps? What the scientific community is trying to understand very quick in South Africa, but also international, yeah? You try to get a better understanding where there is any clinical epidemiological evidence to suggest phenotypic impact. A phenotypic impact, it means that this virus is behaving differently, yeah? The first big question that we're trying to answer, if it is increased transmissibility, it needs to be confirmed, but it's very plausible or more or very likely from our data that this increased transmissibility, both from one strain dominating more virus and the, and, and the, the protein changing, potentially entering it easy in the body, yeah? does increase pathogenicity. We, we don't know, but the, the main evidence point, no, this virus should not be more pathogenic than the other one. Of course, if you have a lot of more transmission, we're gonna have a lot of more sick people just in the numbers, and we have to be really careful to not overwhelm our health system, yeah? And the next big question, it is the escape from neutralizing antibodies to see if this virus could reinfect individuals. The evidence points to potentially no, but we have to do that and understand that very quick, and Professor Abdul Karim will point to that. Uh, at the same time that we are doing the genomic surveillance, we are also uh, growing the virus in the laboratory. That's doing with some of our colleagues at uh, just in the same building. Just to so be aware, CRISP is in the same building as Caprissa that Professor Abdul Karim is the director. And then we have a third uh, center called the Africa Health Research Institute. And we work with a, a, a professor there, Alex Siegel, to grow the virus to see if in fact more uh, in a cell system, but also to see how neutralizing antibodies would affect this virus, yeah. So we needed to strengthen genomic surveillance, what it means, we need to increase sampling in, in the main areas that are being affected by the second wave, yeah, but also to other provinces, and we're working very close with the NICD, the UCT, Stellenbosch, and the group, and the University of the Free State to understand if this virus are already find in the province, yeah. And we also have to link very quick with clinical investigation of cases of suspected reinfection or more severe development. So just to conclude, genomic surveillance is a critical component of the public health response. It has been widely used and very effectively in the countries that control very well this pandemic, such as China, yeah, Singapore, yeah, Australia, New Zealand, the UK also use a lot of, of genomic surveillance. And here in South Africa, we have the chance to use that from the beginning. And we think that earlier identifying that strain is very important. Eh? We have detectable a new lineage with change at key sites at the spike glide proteins, which show evidence of rapid and diffuse spread through three provinces. We are now trying to get information of the other ones, but we are not surprised if it already has spread to the other province. And the full significance of this change in the virus is yet to be determined, and work is ongoing to characterize the impact of that, yeah. Just to finish, I couldn't finish without acknowledging a large number of collaborators that was a truly group team effect to really sample and work around the clock. Thank you very much, and I would pass to Professor Ab Salim Abdul Karim. Thank you very much, Professor Dolivera. I want to just uh, thank Professor Dolivera and his team, it was a consortium that was established very early on. We, he came to see me about it back in February. And I want to thank the Department of Science and Innovation and the South African Medical Research Council for funding this important work. What I would like to do very briefly at this stage is I would like to share with you an understanding of what this what these results mean and what their potential implications are. 
So I'll talk about the way in which the epidemiology can be interpreted in relation to this new variant. So this is the curve we are all very familiar with. The solid black line is the seven-day moving average of the number of cases we see each day. The gray bars are the number of admissions, and the red line is the number of COVID-19 reported deaths. We know that when we saw our first case on the 5th of March, we had a rapidly growing epidemic, and then it slowed down, and we eventually saw our peak in July and August. We then went into a situation of low transmission for almost three months. And then in early November, we started seeing the cases rise again. And you know that Minister Kesey announced that we are now well and truly in the second surge, which is reflected by this rapid increase in cases. If we look at what that means at a provincial level, we know in the first wave, that the various provinces had the epidemic rising at different rates, and so we expected to see that again. In this time, though, the epidemic started in the Eastern Cape, and it was the first to rise. There's a whole range of reasons why that's the case. I won't go into that right now. And subsequently, we've seen a rise in cases in the Western Cape, KwaZulu-Natal, Gauteng. And what about the other provinces? If you magnify this area at the bottom and look at all of these other provinces, even though they have smaller numbers, we are now seeing a rise in cases in all provinces. In other words, our second wave is well and truly established now in all of our provinces. What are we seeing? If we just look at the Western Cape in the light green line, that's the curve for the first wave. In the dark green line, that's the curve for the second wave. In the first wave, what we saw was the epidemic starting off in Cape Town and then spreading around to the other districts. And so we had this long drawn out a little peak and then it came down. What we are seeing now is a, 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 the rate of increase in cases is similar to the first wave, but we've seen now that the epidemic is much, much more in terms of cases than we have seen in the first wave. So the second wave has now well and truly overshot the peak that we saw in the first wave in the Western Cape. If we look at one other province for illustrative purposes, in KwaZulu-Natal, in the light orange line is the cases, the seven-day moving average of the cases in the first wave. If we look at the second wave in the dark orange line, what we are seeing is a rapid rise in the cases. Now, we wanted to also have some idea of whether th this virus may be associated with an alteration in the, the uh, number of deaths. And so when we look at the cases at the time when we had 4,000 cases at this point here, and we look at the recorded deaths, it was close to 12,000. If we go back to the first wave and we look at the point at which we had 4,000 cases, it was similar, roughly at around 12,000. There are some caveats to the comparison, but we wanted just to get a quick impression of whether we are seeing more or less deaths in the second wave in relation to the cases, just to get some idea of whether there's any change in the pathogenicity of the virus. And this, this data are very preliminary. And uh, at this point, they certainly do not show any red flags. So what do we know about the fine balance between the virus and the host? Viruses usually evolve to become more transmissible. That's pretty uh, clear. We see that with almost all viruses. And it's for a very simple reason that if a virus evolves to become less transmissible, then what happens is that it then wipes itself out. The ones that are more transmissible will become dominant because they transmit better. Also, viruses tend to evolve to become less severe. 
they become less pathogenic and less lethal. Again, for the very simple reason, if a new variant of the virus is more severe, the patients are sicker and so do not walk around and go to mass gatherings and don't spread the virus. And so a virus generally will evolve over time to become more transmissible and less severe. So we have been monitoring this virus for these changes right from the word go in March. And Professor Dolivera and his team have been doing so. And we pretty much have got used to the idea we're going to see one or two changes in the virus each month because it, it's a virus that's pretty stable. But these changes that do occur, they mostly occur in humans in response to immune pressure. And sometimes they occur when they pass through another species. For example, the original bat virus was able to infect humans when it passed through another species thought to be the pangolins. So that's the two ways in which the virus spreads, uh, the virus changes its genetic structure. The SARS-CoV-2, as I've pointed out, has been relatively stable in the first wave. We know and we've recorded that we have somewhere between 30 and 40 different lineages. And most of them are uh, derivatives of the trans more transmissible D612 variant, which we acquired from Europe. It's different from the original Wuhan strain because it's slightly more transmissible because of this variation. So we, we have always been seeing just these lineages and we know we've had a quite a large diversity and three or four of these lineages account for about a third to around 40% of all our viruses in South Africa. So we've used to the idea of high, variety, uh, high variability in, and different viruses spreading at the same time. The second wave, now that we're seeing it in all provinces, is showing some early signs that it is spreading faster than the first wave. It's still very early, but at this stage, the preliminary data suggest that the virus that's now dominating in the second wave is spreading faster than the first wave. It's not clear if the second wave has more or less deaths. In other words, the severity is still unclear. As I said, we would expect it to be a less severe virus, but we do not have clear evidence at this point. We certainly have not seen any red flags looking at our current death information. So we know that this is the, the, the two diagrams that really give the key message is the first is the one on the left. This diagram shows that we had all of these different strains that were routinely spreading in South Africa during our first wave and in subsequently. But we saw a few weeks ago, this little yellow blip. And initially there was no reason to be concerned. We would expect to see these kinds of variations arrive. But what became quite different that we did not expect is the rapid way in which this variant, now in the yellow, this new 501v2 variant has become dominant in South Africa, as Professor Dolivera has so clearly outlined. And this particular virus has three mutations on the receptor binding domain. That's the, that's the actual part of the virus that attaches to the human cell at the ACE2 receptor. And the, one of the interpretations of these changes is that it increases the affinity for the ACE2 receptor. The other two mutations also convey and possibly add some potential antibody escape. But at this stage, the full implications of the combination of the three mutations still needs to be understood in more detail. The second diagram that is concerning is this diagram, that when we look at the 501v2 variant, Professor Dolivera already pointed out that when you look at this 501 variant, the CT score, the CT number is lower than the other viruses that we routinely have uh, that have been spreading during our first wave. What does that mean? It means that the amount of virus 
that's in the swab is higher. It's, you have to in interpret it in the inverse. A lower score means a higher amount of virus. We refer to that as the viral load. So when we're doing that swab, we're getting a lot more virus in these patients that have the 501v2 variant. So the full implications of this need to be understood, and these data are still very preliminary. We want to increase the sample size and ensure that this is a very stable estimate. But at this stage, I will just speculate the following. The first is that the higher viral load in these swabs may translate into a higher efficiency of transmission. In other words, higher transmissibility, and that fits in with the epidemiological data that I've provided. The second is that if there's higher transmissibility and higher efficiency, it may translate into a higher R0. R0 is that each person who's infected, how many other people they're going to infect. The third is that while the other viruses are still transmitting, right, because they are still in the community, they are still spreading, this virus is spreading so much faster that when we take swabs, it is the dominant variant that we see. And then the final point I'd like to speculate in terms of the meaning of this higher viral load is that this may translate eventually into a second wave that may have many more cases than the first wave. So this is not original data. I'm not presenting you data. I'm just speculating on what this may mean, that we're seeing this virus become dominant and that it's associated with a higher viral load. So let me end off with explaining what is it we do know and what is it we don't know about this variant. So we do know that it's an unusual variant. And it's an unusual for a new variant to contain so many mutations. Usually you'll see a variant with just a few mutations. And particularly to see a variant with three mutations in the RBD, especially including the N501, which we think in, uh, has been shown in STAR and others have shown this in the paper in Cell, that alters the attachment affinity to the ACE2. In other words, it has more affinity. It attaches better to the human cell. The 501 has been reported in other countries, including the UK, Australia, and several others. It accounts for about 2% of all the viruses that have been sequenced. There are about a quarter million sequences available. And in our country at this time, we are finding between 80 and 90% of the viruses are this 501 mutant. So we're seeing a much higher proportion than is being seen elsewhere in the world. We're seeing early signs that the new variant is spreading fast, sometimes faster than the first wave viruses, and that it is widespread. We don't yet have data from Gauteng. Those viruses are still being sequenced, including the free state, but it probably is quite widespread given the rapidity with which it has been growing. So what is it we don't know? We don't know where it came from, and we don't know why it formed. We don't know. We found the first of them, this virus, in Nelson Mandela Bay, but we don't know if it originated in Nelson Mandela Bay. It could have originated anywhere, and somebody could have traveled there, or it could have started spreading there, after being brought in. So we don't know where it originated. What we do know is that we first found it in Nelson Mandela Bay. We have some hypotheses, and I won't go into those right now, but we are investigating that to look at trying to provide some clarity on that issue. The second thing is, is it more severe? Well, we don't know. It's too early to tell. Third, is it reinfecting people who got infected in the first wave? We have no information to answer that question at this time. But as you heard from Professor Dolivera, we have two laboratories that are growing the virus. It's already growing and available now in the laboratories of the African Health Research Institute. And we will start doing studies to answer that question. It's not hard to answer that question. It just takes time. For example, once we've grown the virus, we will then add in convalescent serum from patients who recovered from the virus in the first wave. 
and to see whether it neutralizes the virus so that we'll have some idea as to whether those who were infected in the first wave are protected from this virus in the second wave. So that's an unanswered question at this time. Will the current vaccines work against this variant? Well, this also needs to be studied. It'll take a little bit of time for us to answer this question. And it's currently being studied by a range of different groups, including CRISP, ARI, NICD, and Caprice. And we, we can look at patients who've been vaccinated and look at their serum panels, which are available once we've got the virus growing well, to look at whether it neutralizes the virus. So all of these will be questions we will be able to answer with time, but we do not know those answers just yet. So what should we do next? I think the first is, is that there is reason for concern that we have a virus that seems to be spreading rapidly, but it is something we can deal with. It's a virus that's already uh, been found in Australia. It's not exactly the same mutations, but they have the 501 mutation, and they've been able to also control it. Importantly, the same diagnostic tests, the same prevention strategies, and the same treatments work against this variant. So this is an opportunity for us to reinvigorate and to enhance our prevention measures to hold back this virus as we see it spreading rapidly through our communities. We do not need to change any of these strategies at this point in terms of the current diagnostics are still effective. Our current strategies of social distancing, hand hygiene, uh, symptom checking, mask wearing, all of them remain the basic strategies of prevention for this virus. Similar 501 variants are found in other countries. They do not have the same uh, RBD uh, uh, changes, but they have the basic 501 variant in these countries. We need to inform key role players and the public, and we started doing that yesterday, and the public is being informed today. The data are being published in a journal. The paper's almost written, and Tulio and his team are hoping to have that submitted pretty soon. We need to urgently increase our phylogenetic screening. We need to sequence many more viruses. We need to get a sense of how this virus is spreading, where about in throughout the country. So we need to Im increase our uh, screening. It should be noted that this is not an easy thing to do. To do a full genome sequence of this virus is an expensive and time-consuming business. And then finally, We've already put in motion some studies and we work, we'll work with many others and this is an open invitation to others who want to help answer these four questions. The virus is readily available. Uh, we can supply uh, that to other investigators. We'll collaborate with many of our colleagues across the world, including uh, throughout Africa. And fortunately, in terms of the actual uh, answering the question on vaccine trials, we have several vaccine trials that are currently underway in South Africa, including, for example, the J&J &J vaccine. So we'll have you know, direct clinical trial evidence as well as laboratory evidence about the impact of this virus and whether our current vaccines are still effective, which I would expect it to be. On that note, I'd like to uh, uh, thank my colleagues for uh, making this important presentation, and I hope I've given you a sense of what is it we do know, what is it we don't know, and uh, giving you some impression of what we need to be thinking about next. On that note, I'd like to hand back to Minister Mkhisi. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abdul Karim. Uh, uh, together with the team led by Professor uh, De Oliveira, uh, and the rest of the consortium has having been introduced. May I at this point call on uh, uh, my colleague, Minister Nzimande, to uh, make his reflections on this matter. I will come in after that and then we open up for questions. Prepared. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. And thanks to Professor De Oliveira and uh, Professor Slim Karim for the explanation that they've given. We hope uh, 
this actually explains, as Professor Karim was saying, it's bad news, but at least uh, <clears throat> what has also been presented relates to what needs to be done, and that uh, going forward, we're ready to actually deal and manage this despite the threats that it, it poses. All I want to say, Minister Mkise, and to all my colleagues, I'm also joined by my DG Mjoaka, who has also indicated that on our side, we are really committed to continue to support this. This work that is being done, already uh, a budget has been submitted to us, Minister Mkise, as DSI, of about 45 million rands, and we are willing to say that we can commit right now 25 million rands for this work to be done, as indicated in terms of further research and further studies that actually needs to be done on the score so that we continue to make sure that science is there in support and in service of your department as you lead this effort to actually deal with the COVID-19. We started this on the 20th of, on, on, in June 2020 with this project and already it's beginning, as I have said, to show some progress and there is no reason why we should not continue as it underlines the importance of genomics in dealing with this pandemic, which also lays a very good basis, by the way, for future challenges that we may have uh, going forward. Thank you very much, Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Minister Nzimande and the Director General, uh, Dr. Mtuaha. Your, your support in this uh, is quite critical. And uh, may we also say thank you for the uh, support that you have just indicated and the further commitment to ensuring that this work continues. Uh, I want to then uh, make some comments on this matter. Before I go into the issues relating to this uh, variant, I want to talk about this second wave. If you ask me a question, what has caused me concern on this second wave? But by the way, before I proceed, let me acknowledge that we have got our colleagues from uh, uh, WHO, Dr. Kalua, who is also in attendance. There's also the CEO for Africa, CDC, Dr. John Gengasong, who's uh, actually also on the, <clears throat> on the call. And then there's also uh, 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 observing from uh, uh, the virtual platform is uh, uh, the WHO regional uh, Afro region uh, director, uh, Dr. Mweti. Uh, of course, <clears throat> she's not full time on this because uh, she, she's dealing with some uh, family uh, uh, issues at this point. And I uh, want to just uh, 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 acknowledge that. Now the question, if you were to ask me about the second wave, firstly, we knew it was coming, but uh, none of us actually expected it to come as quickly as it did. Now, there was not anything, uh, there was no specific uh, 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 projection that would put, but uh, that it came before the, before, sooner than it was expected, it did take us off <coughs> in a bit of a, a, a challenge because you recall that a few months earlier, a number of hospitals, field hospitals had been kind of uh, started to be dismantled. The second issue that's been of concern is that uh, it's coming at a time when the behavior during the festive season is likely to worsen the spread of the uh, COVID-19. It's, it's a season for people uh, coming together, you know, uh, in congested, congested areas and so on. So a whole lot of issues there. The other issue is that uh, we had noticed some degree of complacency uh, where, where with the wearing of masks uh, and uh, the hand sanitizers and so on. And, and, we're, and we've been picking up a number of cluster outbreaks and that we attributed to the uh, complacency with this. The other concern that, uh, the fifth concern, the concern that we've got is that the second wave is increasing uh, during this season, but we actually believe it's most likely to increase any case after the season, because you have got people coming together now, but uh, there's been a lot of movement of people into various provinces. That movement is going to be reversed early in the year. And so it may well actually have another bump where in the numbers are showing an increase. So these are issues that uh, we are now looking at as we're going to be reopening in January, that this is another area of concern. 
Of course, the other area has been the high number of, uh, uh, you know, 14 to 19 years uh, uh, of uh, youth who have actually tested positive in a higher number than we have actually seen before. All of these uh, together, uh, now we have got this new news of the uh, of this mutant <coughs> variant. So it does then say to us, we should be concerned about it, but it's not the reason to panic. If there's anything which we need to actually emphasize now, as Professor Abdul Karim has said, is that uh, it's going to be important for us to emphasize on what we know works. And those are the issues of wearing off masks, using sanitizers, uh, hand washing, and distancing. Because those will work as effectively for the COVID-19 as we have known it, and they'll work as effectively on the variant because it's the behavior of that pandemic that we are actually targeting. So I think that if there's a, anything to be taken from this discussion is that we have noticed that there's a variant, but at the same time, what we have uh, um, uh, advised should be the way to deal with it. it. needs to be emphasized that we must loyally stick adhere to this practice of non-pharmaceutical intervention because that is the way we'll be able to deal with it. The other aspect that I think is important <clears throat> is to also appeal to the media and also our colleagues in the medical and scientific community that we should focus on the facts. We've come in here to share information as being factually recorded, but we need to avoid entering into speculations and issuing unproven statements or generating panic or disinformation, because this situation can be handled in the way that COVID-19 has been handled, even though it might be a variant, but it's actually important that we can handle it because the approaches are still the same as what we've been using dealing with uh, COVID-19 as it had been uh, brought uh, to our attention. Many countries have experienced uh, a second wave that was more severe than the first wave. So we're not different now to other countries. Many countries have gone through what we've gone through. Even in countries who have not themselves reported any mutations, we've seen that there's been an increase. So in our case, we're also seeing that there might be, that might be the pattern. So we must get up for a stronger fight against COVID-19. Now, the next question somebody would ask, okay, what are we going to be doing now? Well, firstly, our current case management is guided by clinical manifest uh, manifestations of the pandemic. And uh, this approach has still been effective, irrespective of the reports of the mutation that has been identified. In other words, the same treatment that we have been using before, we're going to continue to use now. There's been no evidence to suggest that uh, there is a need to change any of the clinical treatment. And if there would be such a situation, we'll talk about it and then we'll deal with it at that point. But right now, we will continue to treat in the way that we have been treating before, even the, the fact that there's been a variant should not make us feel that there's any change. But we have also directed <clears throat> that uh, our ministerial advisory committee, which is the clinic clinician subcommittee, should go into this matter. And then whenever there's going to be a need for changing the clinical treatment and patient management protocols, then they would actually report that and give us advisory when they deem it necessary. So we're watching that space Right now, there's no need to change. There's no need to panic to think that there's some new uh, treatment that we're going to need or at this point to ask the question as to whether uh, any of the treatment that has been used, is it going to be effective or not? At the moment, it has been effective even before we knew that there was a variant. So we want to keep that as a matter of reassurance to the public. Then uh, <clears throat> someone else might ask the question, because we have discussed this, <clears throat> uh, are we going to put... Uh, we're going to uh, bring in new additional restrictions now, uh, you know, lockdown five and lockdown what, level three, level four, whatever. The point is that the president has just recently announced more restrictions, which are using a differentiated approach across the country, which means that we implement different containment measures depending on the infection spread in such areas as hotspots and also what we anticipate as social behavior during the festive season as well as what we need to, to strengthen inspections and enforcement measures so that uh, we can contain the spread of the infection. We will keep to that. We are not proposing any new restrictions that are associated with this variant. This variant, we're going to treat it as the COVID-19 that we have seen before. 
until the scientists come with something new that makes us change something there. So we are saying we will keep to that. We are not bringing a recommendation for the Coronavirus Command Council to bring in new restrictions, as it were. What the president announced is what we're going to stick to. Until there's a new issue, we will not be changing that. Uh, in fact, as far as we're concerned, this discovery does not yet necessitate additional uh, additional uh, um, measures need to be ta to be taken. Then the reports, which are based on surveillance and intense monitoring, will continue to guide our response, which is driven by science. We will declare new districts as hotspots when the situation arises and they reach the threshold, and then we continue to monitor how we, this increase, increases the impact on our health services and on healthcare workers. In other words, whatever we have declared, if tomorrow we declare another district as a hotspot, it will be because of the criteria that we set even before we knew about the variant. And therefore, we will deal with it on that basis. So if there's two, three, four, uh, whatever number of districts that we think they're hotspots and we say so, it will be because of the pre-agreed uh, uh, um, uh, factors that have been taken into account. We have a resurgence plan that guides us on this. So that affair, again, will not be affected by this, uh, by this variant. Uh, in response uh, uh, the, to the second wave, We've directed that all the provinces must reactivate their research and plans, and they've done so, and therefore they must mount a, an appropriate response uh, to COVID-19, ensuring the following issues. One, the adequate uh, uh, you know, human resources for health uh, and employment of nurses and doctors and all staff that is needed so that we, we can cope with the pressure that we're seeing in the hospital. We also have uh, asked them to look at reactivation of field hospital beds that have been closed and reuse those that are available and also preparing more beds in the ICUs, uh, which we used in the earlier upsurge, bringing in ventilators and other necessary equipment, also provision of adequate oxygen. So all of this was actually uh, already directed to all the provinces ahead of this announcement. So we're going on with that work. We also have said that there must be adequate uh, psychosocial support for our staff, healthcare workers, so that they, give, uh, they get the support. But they will still be prioritized for vaccinations uh, in, uh, of against COVID-19 next year. Invariably, of course, as you have heard, the research raises a number of questions, and then we have directed that uh, there should be support so that uh, that, further, that further investigation uh, research should be done. For example, the point that's been raised by uh, uh, Professor Abdul Karim, if you have been infected before and you develop some degree of immunity, are you now vulnerable or liable to a reinfection no one knows that, and so we will not uh, delve into speculation on that matter. There's no information about it. When the information comes, we'll talk about it. Then uh, the other question that's been raised is about the effectiveness of the vaccines. The vaccines that uh, have been uh, uh, that are being researched, uh, as far as we know, they are effective in dealing with this issue. And therefore, uh, unless there is a new uh, research that shows that there's a problem will continue with the program of vaccines when the vaccines come next year. So people shouldn't be worried that, okay, why are you continuing with this vaccine? Because there's now a variant. We'll continue anyway, because firstly, the first COVID uh, is still there, but secondly, we will want to get evidence that there is a problem with the vaccines. And so that is in the hands of the scientists. So before uh, there's any change, there was no new action that we will deal with it as such. But I want to take this opportunity to sp speak to our youth. Last week, I made uh, an announcement that we had entered, uh, entered the second wave, and that's mostly young people who are testing positive in recent weeks, and it continues to be the case. Our clinicians have also warned us that uh, things have, have changed and that younger, previously healthy people are now becoming very sick. Despite all these warnings in the past couple of weeks, we continue to see recent videos of so on social media of youth partying, uh, in large numbers, even some displaying kids in games and uh, also not using, not, not wearing masks, and, uh, and some clearly intoxicated. And uh, we're better to actually ask that uh, those who are part of some of these uh, rage parties need to go for, in, for, for, for tests. And we found quite a number of people who are already affected and are infected as a result of that. Uh, our youth are not wearing masks and are clearly intoxicated that they throw away caution to the wind and don't care of the, uh, about the rules uh, of the disaster. It cannot be that our youth must uh, only adhere to life-saving measures only after being policed to do so. 
We therefore call on parents and caregivers to understand uh, and our youth to understand that it's now not just a matter of thinking about others, but even about yourself. Uh, and therefore, you, are, you, you are yourself are equally at risk uh, of dying of COVID-19. I think it's important that the enjoyment must never actually be a reason why we must lose another life. And that is a point that I think our youth need to be able to understand. And all of this is important because we've dealt with some of the uh, you know, uh, uh, challenges such as AIDS and so on, where when uh, we, know we had uh, mothers and grandmothers bearing their children. I think it's important for us to say there's enough knowledge now for us to be able to behave in such a way that we can save everyone and save ourselves. And therefore, our message out of this variant is that the situation can be contained, depends on how well we stick to the basics that have been uh, 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 you know, uh, indicated, that of using masks and distancing and hand washing and sanitizers. That remains our fundamental issue. So the information that you have got today will continue to update uh, in the interest of transparency and keeping the public informed so that all of us are aware where the situation is. And when there's a change, will actually indicate what is new that is needed. At this point, I'd like to hold it and then uh, request that uh, you ask the questions. And then uh, the team here is much bigger than the two uh, professors who have presented. They will take us, uh, they will give us the responses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister, Honorable Minister Nzemande and uh, Prof. Uh, Salim Abdul Karim and Prof. De Oliveira. Thank you very much. Uh, for taking the nation through these developments. I will now move on to the questions, Minister, uh, and, uh, and to the consortium from uh, the um, genomics group and to all scientists, members of the MEC that are on the call now. Um, I do have questions from both the chat group and from my group. So I will start with the questions coming from my group and we'll move to the questions coming from the chat group. Um, colleagues, we will answer all the questions, but if you do, if you have been covered, please don't repeat the same question. Um, Minis, uh, I will start with uh, probably questions that are probably more for the scientists and then we'll move on to questions that perhaps the ministers can respond to. The first question is uh, from Femida at ITV News. Um, As the mutations occur, will they affect the human cell further and does it alter symptoms in any way? Femida Kasim. Uh, apologies, I don't think she's with ITV News anymore. Um, I then have um, a question from Sophie Mukwena from SABC for an editor. Have you been able to trace or track patient zero of this virus? I assume she means this variant in South Africa in Nelson Mandela to be specific. I have a question from Elsa B. Brits who asks, have you seen any clinical effects at all? from uh, LCB Brits and Freya Vietblatt. Um, I have a question from Nadia Honeyball who, uh, from NetVac24 has asked, has any new or different symptoms been detected in people contracting the mutated variant and how reliable are the current COVID uh, tests in the light of this new variant? And then from Zolega Kodasha from SABC, other than the rapid spread of the new variant, are you aware how it affects those who may be infected. Do we see the same symptoms as reflected since the outbreak earlier this year? Does the mutation of the virus mean that it is more aggressive? I'll stop there in, uh, for now from, from this particular cohort of questions, Minister and the scientific team. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all of those who raised these questions. I'll, uh, there are three of us who will attempt to answer these questions. It's Professor Dolivera, Professor Lessels, and myself. I will ask uh, Professor Dolivera to start and uh, answer the questions he, he would like to, and then we'll uh, deal with the remainder. Professor Dolivera. Uh, thank you, Professor Abdukari. Yeah. So, so the first question it is about um, the virus mutating. Yeah. So, so that's what 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 virus do. Yeah. And and we know that very well from HIV, for example, it develops sometimes resistance to antiretrovirals. Yeah. 
So it is common the virus mutate, and normally we have a fixed mutation rate across the world, around two mutations per month. Yeah. So what is is not so common? It is accumulating a lot of mutations very quick in the receptors and and in the main binding site. Yeah. And we are also seeing the same ones uh, across the world, especially in the UK. Yeah, it's also a, a, one large transmission cluster with the same variant. Yeah. So the answer is to to that 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 is um, reason for concern, as Professor Dukarim highlight, but it's also a reason to to understand better this variant, which we call 501v2, is the second big variant spreading uh, across the world with that mutation. But to tell you that there is no concern, especially on the diagnostics, they will not, they, they were not made to that region of the virus. So our di diagnostic worked perfectly. To be honest, all the samples that we got was from a positive diagnostic on the three markers. So we have no concern on that on that area. That was another question. Yeah. In relationship with patient zero, no, it is it is very difficult. It's not impossible to identify the patient zero, and you notice that uh, we could still not identify the source of the zoonotic transmission of SARS-CoV-2 to humans. Yeah, and. Honestly, that's neither important at the moment. The most important thing is to try to curb the transmission of this lineage, yeah, as we, we, we have done in the, in the first wave. The objective normally is to try to decrease transmission and extinguish a lineage, yeah. One lineage with a similar mutation in Australia in that position have been extinguished. So it is possible to, to, to basically stop the transmission of this lineage. But as our minister mentioned, yeah, we will have to take much more serious our prevention efforts and also to try to really decrease the, not, not to have a chance to this virus to stay spreading very, very far. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Donovan. Professor Lethos, do you want to comment on the clinical issues? Yeah, so I, th I think there are a few uh, questions all linked about what, what do we understand about the clinical effects? Uh, could this have different symptoms um, or be more aggressive and have a different disease course? And the, the reality is we, we don't know the answer to a lot of that. But we will, now that we've detected this new uh, virus lineage, we'll be working with speed to try and understand uh, whether it does have any clinical impact. It's highly unlikely that it would have any dif different clinical symptoms. There's, there's no reason to believe that, and that wouldn't fit with our understanding. But one of our concerns is, could there uh, be a difference in the progression of the disease. And as, as one of the questions said, a more aggressive uh, disease course. It's challenging to understand that because as we go into the second wave and we see this rapid rise in cases, clinicians are again faced with seeing a lot of patients in the hospitals and a lot of patients who are very sick. And so getting a sense of whether they're seeing a different disease course is challenging and it needs us to look at the data very carefully and tease out some of the information in that to, to really understand. And as I say, we'll be working at speed to, to do that and to get a better understanding. Thank you very much, Richard. I'll just add two points, if I might. The first is that this information was presented to the Ministerial Advisory Committee and several of the clinicians there are now initiating research that will help us answer the question on whether there are any variations in clinical features. I would be surprised if they are, but we need to do empiric research to ask that question and answer it. So we don't know the answer for sure at this time, but the evidence is being, uh, steps have already been initiated to start looking at that question. The second is, I want to just uh, explain that what we are talking about 
is a new variant. It's not a new strain. Because in SARS-CoV-2, we don't yet have a nomenclature to define the different strains of the virus. So we don't talk about strains, we talk about lineages or we talk about variants. So I want to just uh, request that you don't use the word strain because it, there is no such thing as uh, different strains per se because we haven't defined that. So just use the word variant. It is scientifically the most accurate way to describe this new variation in the virus that we are seeing. I'll stop there. Over to you, Luazi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Karim. Um, I will continue to stay with uh, technical slash scientific slash clinical questions. Uh, I have a question from Sbun Galwa with, uh, from Newsroom Africa. Is there any information regarding the recovery period of those infected with the new strain? So as a country, um, should we review the isolation period from 14 to 10 days? Uh, will the isolation... Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, Lozi. Can I just make a quick request? We have a uh, CEO of uh, Africa CDC, Dr. John Gengasong, would like to ask him to make a comment because he's got another agent uh, uh, pressing matter that he needs to attend to. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, uh, Dr. Nkenga Song. If you could just give us a comment, we'll go back to the question and answer session. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I mean, let me, uh, first of all, uh, really congratulate the team for uh, uh, this important uh, 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 discovery of this new variant. And I followed the presentation from the start to now, and I'm very uh, impressed with the way they've used genomics uh, to track in this epidemic. This is exactly what we should be doing, applying a combination of standard epidemiologic uh, tools with genomic sequencing to understand the evolution of this uh, virus. Clearly, we, there's still a lot of work to be done ahead and of us to understand this, the, 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 the clinical and uh, outcome of this uh, variant and what it means for uh, for patient management as the minister rightly stated. So I'm very pleased to say that we are ready to uh, work with you very closely to continue to understand the dynamics and evolution of this variant and I lo uh, we look forward as Africa CDC to working with you in this respect. Thank you. Thank you very much Dr. Nkenga Song and certainly your presence here is really very important and so we will continue the collaboration uh, thank you very much, and thanks for the time to uh, come and share with us your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Loazimanzi, please proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Yes, indeed, uh, the field of applied genomics is extremely exciting. Um, for, I will just repeat Sbungalwa's question. Is there any information regarding the recovery period? Uh, and, just, and, you know, should we re be reviewing the recovery days? Um, uh, I'm just going to be first selecting some of the more clinical questions is okay from news 24 jenna Furster, is the new strain similar to the uk's vui 2020 12/01 or is it the same thing um right it's a piece of my from is full view if there are new generic if there are new genetic variants as a natural process that viruses undergo, can one be infected with more than one? And if so, what is the effect of that? Um, and uh, right now, I'm going to move now to the uh, chat box and see what clinical questions we may have there. Um, so there is one from David, from Dr. David Tumare. The variant that is dominant, is it more virulent, hence causing more severe COVID-19? Um, a question for Prof. Karim specifically. We've heard indications from seroprevalence tests now underway in Soweto that 25% of the population may have been infected during the first wave, possibly more. If true, what could that say about SA's outbreak and about potentially high levels of immunity? Um, then a question from Criselda: Has the virus's behavior changed? If so, what are the changes? A mutated virus sounds instinctively scary, but to mutate and change is what viruses do. So why, what is the challenge now? I think the why was supposed to be a what. 
Um, another question from Chris Alder, can the current ARVs be considered as a preventative measure? Your take on the use of remdesivir to prevent patients from being chronic whilst we seek further clarity. A question from Insol at BDFM, is the emergence of the new variant the reason, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to wait for this question a little bit later, uh, apologies. Um, right, we can stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Manzi. Um, I think there are a few questions on the variant itself, and I think it's important that we deal with the issue of how similar or different it is from the reported UK, uh, where they talked about the new variant under investigation. I'll ask Professor Dolavera to address that issue, and then I will uh, address most of the others together with Professor Lessels. Professor Dolavera. Okay, thank you. So, so in the UK, they, they also identify uh, a variant or a lineage which, which they call the variant under investigation. That's what VUI mean. And they call VUI 2020 because they are really in trying to investigate that. Yeah, there is quite a few similarities between these two lineages, yeah. So what what are the similarities? The similarities uh, is that they they have also multiple uh, changes on the spike proteins. Yeah, in the UK they have six changes in the in, in spike protein. Yeah, plus a deletion that could easily count as one or two changes. Yeah, and we have eight changes in the in the in the spike protein. Yeah. They also have a similar number of mutations, yeah, which it mean around 20, 22. We, our one also have around 22. In addition to that, the other similarity is that they, they share a common position. That's the 501Y. And that's why we have decided to call our lineage 501YV2, the second major variant that has been detected in the past few weeks. Yeah. Out of that, the rest of the, the mutations, they, they, they are different. So we are similar on the number and also on the number, both at the spike and also in the genome and one key mutation that, that's associated with binding of the receptor, the 501. But out of that, these lineages, they emerge very differently. Yeah, they would fall very far apart on the evolutionary history of the virus. Yeah, so in the same way that they, they went to, to the parliament and to the public to explain that and put this lineage under investigation, very serious investigation to try to stop and understand more, that's exactly what we are doing in South Africa. And we work both together with the researchers in the UK as part of the WHO, the World Health Organization Evolution Group. Yeah. So we so and both of this data, both of South Africa and the UK, they are open available. That's one effort that what we're trying to do as a scientific community is to share data and samples very quick so we can answer a lot of the questions that is coming from these new variants. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Dorga. Professor Lessels, you want to comment and then I'll deal with the remaining questions. Yeah, so, so I think there was a, a clinical question around the recovery period and whether we think there would be any difference in the recovery period and whether that requires uh, rethinking the isolation period. And I think there's, there's nothing to make us believe that recovery from an illness would be different and certainly no indication at the moment to, to consider changing the isolation period. There was a question about as there's these different strains circulating, different lineages circulating, can you be infected by more than one? And we, we don't think you can be infected by more than one at the same time. Our concern is more about that the antibodies you generate after an infection may not be able to recognize a new virus if it has certain changes in its structure. And that's what we're now trying to understand with these G2 
genetic changes that we see here, whether they are enough uh, to escape the antibody response and to cause a reinfection. Um, there were similar questions. I think we answered them about whether this is more virulent, causing more severe disease. We don't know. And we're, we're working at speed to try and understand that from the, from the clinical information we have in the country. And there was a question around ARVs and, and remdesivir. I think we know in terms of the antiretrovirals and their use, uh, there are clinical trials ongoing. Um, and there's no evidence yet to support uh, their use in routine clinical practice. And the remdesivir, uh, again, unfortunately, we saw disappointing results from a clinical trial that showed um, in the context of hospitalized patients, it, it uh, had no clinical effect. And so it's currently not recommended for use. And there's no reason to believe with this lineage of the virus that uh, there would be any different response to remdesivir. Uh, so I finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lessos. I'll just quickly answer the remaining questions. Just to add on to remdesivir, remdesivir acts at a different stage in the way in which the virus replicates. So it's not impacted by these variations that we are seeing in the genome. So remdesivir, if it has any benefits, it shouldn't be any different for this variant than it would for any other variant. On the issue of the uh, Zero prevalence of antibodies. We yet do not know whether the past infections and the antibodies generated by past infections will neutralize this new variant. I don't anticipate that there will be a difference, but we do not have any evidence one way or the other. At this stage, it remains an open question, one that's already uh, studies are underway to address. Is this virus more virulent? At this stage, we do not think it's more virulent, but we need more clinical studies to confirm that. And those studies, as I mentioned, are currently in planning. And then finally, uh, the issue around whether we need to change our isolation period and recovery there is no indication that that needs to change. That will remain as per our current guidelines. Uh, we see no reason to change that based on the new strain. I'll hand back to you, Dr. Mansi. Thank you, Prof. Karim. Uh, the next set of questions will probably more be for the minister. However, there are some technical questions that have slipped through, so it please that the scientific community can come through on that one, Minister. In the light of what has been presented, it becomes clear that prevention messaging is more critical than ever before. What plans are we making to ramp up the messaging that physical distancing, mask wearing, and hand washing is critical? And this is from Ansel Tom at the Daily Maverick. Uh, she, uh, Ansel continues to ask, the NICD has been at the forefront of the COVID response. What is being done to support them in the light of the work that has to be done to see if the vaccines in the pipeline will work? Um, Minister, if, if, if I may just have an opportunity to just move on to the um, other group, which had more questions for Minister. Um, right. Given, so we have a, now a question from Mariam Issa at Finweek. Given that the new variants of the virus are dominant in SA and spreading so rapidly, might the country be seen to have a responsibility to close its borders to prevent its spread elsewhere in the world? And she continues to ask, or rather, is there any possibility, in your opinion, that other countries may not want to accept travelers of South Africa? A question from Lemza Pharma. If you don't have enough data on whether the COVID-19 vaccine will work on the new variant, will government proceed with the procurement of the vaccine? Um, Tanya Faber from Sunday Times. Among the non-pharmaceutical interventions, should the Minister of Health not also be placing a big emphasis on ventilation? Um, okay, here's a technical question from Craig Jenkinson. 
Um, could the second wave involving the new variant actually serve as a type of natural inoculation if it is proven to be less lethal? And is the alleged slow movement by government in ordering a vaccine for SA linked to questions about the efficacy in treating the new variant? I'll stop there, Minister, and then after these questions, we will move on to some more questions that are in the group. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, the one question relates to what support to be given to the NICD. We um, uh, uh, work with the NICD as a very important institute that deals with the uh, monitoring and uh, the testing, the detection of uh, the um, uh, pandemic, in particular the COVID-19. And therefore, we continuously work together to look at what new uh, additions need to be done in their in investing in, into their institution so that uh, it can become more effective. There's quite a lot that we had to do, bringing in additional um, systems to uh, improve the uh, data capturing to the processing of uh, data and the uh, you know, reorganization of data, the uh, uh, ensuring that we've got the best possible uh, um, uh, data reports that you get from NICT so that uh, we can use that to uh, inform the public and also to guide the response of government. So they remain a very important uh, part of the department. We have uh, uh, emphasized now on the communication that the issues of communication should not just be seen as the Department of Health, but that uh, from presidency to various ministers, premiers to the provinces, and also to ward councillors, and in particularly in the areas of uh, <coughs> the hotspots were actually gone to the level of ensuring that there's loud hailing. Uh, when the numbers increase, we, we improve, we, we emphasize on loud hailing and uh, people uh, in churches and traditional leaders all participating in sending the message across, uh, including various sectors of uh, society. So those, for example, who are uh, you know, uh, in the retail space, we actually have to emphasize that they have to send the message and the reinforcement of the message of uh, uh, you know, non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions. So we do believe that it's important to deal with it, just not only just for government, but also uh, not for central government only, but for all levels and layers of government to deal with it. The uh, question that was raised earlier, <clears throat> there's a question you, you dealt with uh, and uh, didn't complete, that was about uh, uh, what was the issue and the delay on the COVAX uh, commitment. The, the, the decision by cabinet was taken quite a while back. And when the Minister of Finance was asked the question, he responded that this matter has been kind of dealt with because technically uh, the issue was whether we are participating or not. And that was the decision was taken by cabinet that we are. And so everything else was just uh, you know, administrative and technical processing of the issue. So the delay has really been more at that level. Uh, it starts really with a question of understanding. This is the this was the requirement uh, from uh, <clears throat> from Co from uh, Covex that there are certain guarantees that needed to be done, and therefore the format that they used for guarantees and what Treasury was using was not aligned, and it took a while to actually try and clear those issues. And uh, I can just say at this point that I've signed the guarantees now as the Minister of Health, <clears throat> they've been also countersigned by Gavi, and we expect that the money will be deposited in the next two or three days so that uh, that matter is actually closed. But the delay had nothing to do with the principle of whether we're participating in it or not. It had more to do with the uh, just dealing with the systems internally so that uh, you know they're aligned. Right now, everything is aligned, and we're happy that the process is moving on. The other question came from Marianne Issa that relates to the question of uh, uh, do we foresee travelers from South Africa being rejected or closing the borders? Well, we are not uh, going to be closing the borders. In our earlier discussion, we spoke about the fact that uh, there's a need for us to have a, a research that looks into the impact on the migration, particularly uh, migrant workers <coughs> within the region, uh, so that we can see what steps need to be taken at that level. But there's no in, in the closure of borders is not envisaged. And also the issue of travelers, uh, we don't anticipate that uh, there should be an issue. In the first instance, this is not a different virus. It's the same virus with a variant, and therefore uh, we're dealing with uh, COVID-19 
with a, a slight uh, a mutation. The second issue is that not enough is known at this point to actually support any idea of this uh, of uh, South African uh, travelers being uh, reje rejected by any country. But thirdly, every country has had its own variant, and therefore you've heard about the, the, the UK has got its own variant, you've heard about the same variant in, uh, coming from Australia, and that action was done, and in fact it was contained in that situation. As things stand now, the current variant has not reflected any need uh, or any suggestion that it requires different treatment, different testing, different uh, forms of uh, uh, you know, management. And on that basis, therefore, we don't believe that there's any uh, possibility that uh, there should be a rejection of travelers. But uh, research has to be done. And what is most encouraging to us is the fact that uh, the, the uh, research is collaboration right across different countries. So whatever we know, the other countries will know. So there won't be anything new. Is, uh, this is the same virus. I'm not sure if we would, would have done something to the virus that will make it behave in, so, in such a way that uh, every other country doesn't see any different problems. So I expect that there might be various changes that will happen here and then in different countries is for the scientists to be able to indicate the total sum of all the impacts of all those changes. Then uh, the <clears throat> question of emphasizing on ventilation, uh, I think it's a good point that uh, we need to emphasize on that. The fact that the uh, um, person has asked, the, 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 the question has been asked, it does mean that uh, we need to emphasize because if it was felt that there was adequate emphasis and for sure the issue wouldn't have arisen. So I think it's a point to, to us to say we must understand that there might well be a need for emphasizing at that level. Uh, and then the question of the slow movement on gov by government on vaccines. Well, uh, uh, I wouldn't be saying, I wouldn't say that uh, it's slow movement. We know a part of COVAX, and COVAX is actually uh, carrying over 187 countries in the whole world. They have got the buying power that is bigger than any country. And therefore, in terms of the size, and as a result, therefore, we believe that they're doing everything to expedite this process of uh, vaccine acquisition. A number of other initiatives, there's no time to talk about them now, uh, that uh, we actually believe South Africa will be on time to receive the vaccines. And therefore, we don't believe that the government has been slow in it. But we think that the nature of the problem is so varied that, uh, uh, you know, you, you will have seen, I think at the moment, two countries have indicated that they will be starting vaccination, the US, I think the UK, and there will be a few other countries. But obviously, the resource pool of all these countries is not quite necessarily the same. And so you might find that there will be, you know, differences in the phasing of how we are able to do that. We're still calling for equity in the distribution of uh, vaccines. We're also calling for you know, uh, this equity in such a way that uh, you can't have one country completely vaccinating and then there's a whole continent that is left out. So this is some work that we're working on. There are lots of initiatives that we're working on in this regard. If I can just hold it at that, uh, maybe we might want to uh, conclude the questions. I think we should uh, try and round up at this point. Thank you. Yes, Minister, I think let, let, let's indeed round up. Thank you very much. Um, I think maybe we'll just take one or two more questions from the chat and then we will thank the colleagues who have sent us questions in the group. If they've not been covered, um, I will just uh, get back to them uh, offline. Um, there's a question from Dr. Mark Sondrup who says, it's a technical question, how does this differ from the annual antigenic shift and drift of the H and N components of the influenza virus, for example? Um, and uh, we have a question from N. Shongwe who, say, who asks, could the recent congregation of high school learners writing matric exams relate to the emergence of more frequency in the 14 to 19 year age and hence sel selecting out of this new type? I'm reading the question as it is written. Um, Minister, I think um, we can... Uh, a related question, please, can you confirm whether younger people seem to be more severely affected by the new variant? And I think uh, looking at all the other questions, Minister, we can hold it there. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Manzi. Uh, Minister, would you like me to address these and leave the ones for you? Yes, please proceed. In fact, I think all of them are for you. Okay, thank you. 
I'll uh, address them directly and I'll then hand over to Professors Dolivera and Lessels to complete it. So there were really the four questions. The first is, would this uh, faster spreading virus provide us with a level of herd immunity uh, that uh, could emerge as a result of the spread? And the answer to that question is that I think the whole approach of trying to aim to achieve herd immunity with natural infection has been discredited. And what we do know is that even with a rapidly spreading virus of this nature, it is very unlikely that we can reach levels of coverage that would go anywhere close to herd immunity. So I think that that's not really a practical solution, not achievable. The second question is, uh, how does this differ from the, the antigenic shift and drift we see in influenza? And I think I'll ask Professor Dolivera to answer that. I was going to uh, address it in terms of, of flu, but I'll leave that to him. The question relating to uh, high school students and younger people. I think it's quite important to appreciate that even though this virus may have a higher efficiency of transmission, it is still fundamentally dependent on the risk factors that we've seen with the other viruses. In other words, it's the same risk factors. It's the movement of people. It's not having the prevention measures in place. It's uh, interacting with many people, going into crowded places without good ventilation. So I think all of those are the same factors. And what we're seeing in this particular second wave is that those factors combined with perhaps a higher efficiency of transmission is resulting in a, a faster spread. In other words, it's a confluence of factors that are coming together. But fundamentally, this virus, no matter how efficient it is, cannot spread if we are not interacting with others in a situation that enables the virus to spread. And so our traditional prevention measures are really critical and would really stop this. So there's no evidence at this point that this virus is any different in its clinical manifestations or in the age group that it's impacting. Remember uh, a point that perhaps I didn't make clearly enough, that when our second wave was first uh, beginning, we had the same usual lineages of the virus. This particular uh, variant only emerged as the second wave was establishing itself. So we already had the other viruses that were spreading. And when we look at the uh, transmissions that we had with the other strains, they were also in the younger age group. So it's not specific to this particular uh, variant. It is, a, it is a function of who is getting infected by virtue of their risk factors. I'll ask uh, Professor Lessels to comment and then I'll give Professor Dorver the last question relating to how this differs from flu strains. Professor Lessels, do you wanna add anything? I, I don't think I have anything to add to, to, to what you've just said. So I'll leave to Tulio to answer the, the difficult question. Thank you. Professor Donavera. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, the, the answer is not very difficult. Yeah. The, this virus, the SARS CoV 2 and influenza, are very different viruses. Yeah. And the antigenic shift that normally happens in influenza is when two viruses tend to mix together and exchange small pieces of the genome because influenza has a segmented genome. This virus has a one genome is not in segments. So wouldn't the, the process of antigenic shift that happened in influenza wouldn't be the same process that add slightly mutations that create new variants in SARS-CoV-2. So um, 
So the only similarity between these two viruses is that they are respiratory virus. So it's another process that's driving the evolution of the virus and to the best of our knowledge wouldn't be associated with antigenic shift as it is seen in influenza. Yeah, thank you, Professor Karim. Thank you very much. I think that sums it up from us and I'll hand back to you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Abdul Karim, uh, Dr. Uh, Lessels, and uh, Professor De Oliveira, and the team for all the work. And thanks to Minister Nzimande and, Minister, and, and, and the Director General, and of course to uh, the uh, Deputy Minister, Dr. Pasha. Can I just, if you uh, can just uh, <coughs> oblige me, just two minutes. I have a request to uh, deal with this issue uh, in vernacular in a matter of a few sec a few minutes. O kalanje especially ugu memezela uguti njoba slang and selo mslanga no versus obiga ugutu ko kwepeche esina abobo science sebe che umabetu aninga ba cholo uguti i kwanele COVID nineteen seli kale ugu kukuga na pagati i goshaga loaki wengalo loko ugu injo efunu kuti peksi songoba. Uma the Kuku and Seno Gwen's Wooty, Vessel is Patang and Jelena Fanny, and a little one of his looks in Lapas Kitchen, Miss Ananaro, Unyaga Wong. Quarter again, Joba, we conjure Luku, Luku, Kuku, a good sugar, 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 Se se COVID nineteen joba spali lenge akul versus biga e pumalanga koloni ena se inchonalanga koloni se si uwelelege maji na wazi nyuzi fundazo kakuluga zikuwa zulu natali na se khauting kwa tuwa kwa 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 wazi nyuzi fundazo kwa 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 nyuga mana ni haba ndaba na lilikuwa indo kwa 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 Manje kwenye fikra ni skati la posa ongeza sisi pumuli le sisi kuhumaholi le onto le yenzo kutinge le sisi pata ngai yenzo kutinge kubelu la wudi kwa ni kubelege kubelege pambi iko na ngi jukwa lule gile kutinge masilboga silka se imparati nuko kutinge tete nuko skuo pande ya manje sbona abanda wa shaga kuru ibona abanda lili kwa ni kote futi uma na sisi pele abela paiba shuku kutinge abanda wa sha Akfani na kala, bebe nga biba ni nga wakula. Kota na mshani jesu batola, beba ni nga wafiga. Haba nye ba, kota kia kwa kuti. Haba saki sebe nzisi nalo kwa kwa kuzi, for new south chair, akisechenzi iswe. Haba nye ba, ba, ngena kakulo puzwe ni. Ba sebe zene nje leenzu ute kinini, kube lulu tu babe noktelela. So nga leo nje la, kisipo nutu masa tuwa liya kalu kukua lili kwa ni. Nizo zenza alibe ingo, zumanga besi nizu kape. Kwa ti ndeba lule gilege na mshani jogo kuti, sizo kubega sili la, pengale nje lebe sila pangalo, nga gabi kwa kukua kwa alo. Kwa ti okulu kona, kukuti, ukusebe nzisa ama mask, kusaba lule gile, ukezi zanja na ukusebe nzisa ama sanitizer, kusaba lule gile, Utabandu banga shangan babi isi minya minya. Na utu mabe chile nji ni vulu wa mafastela. Banga minya nguza kwa konu mwezo shayozo wanzi uti. Inga andiga kulu leliku wani. Imkona agi mbozo. Mni ngerogi vela yoguti. Ushu kutige abandaba na leliku wani. Abebe ngenwe leliku wani. Epkalin. COVID-19. Kuna mshanje. Masa kona lele. Eli. Lulu kuku. Isenga buyela ni buwana le. 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 Sisa chacha mwuti isi imo, sita zufana na kani. Ogwe sibili, aguko lukukugesi na alo, esu zolenzo kukula shoko bandu oba, sisa zukuwa sila penjenga kala, kakokote kwete la nabogu kwa peshe suwa tulilgus, abashalewe kapilu, kutuma kukonu shinjo lufune uba lenzege, uguti kukula shwa ngeje li shugen, shugit, basi taze li kutuna kukulelo ose lufune ka sulsebenzi. Uba lulegi le futu kuti, Njoba sate ya sifuna uwe kona uwe kwa wama konyele uleli kwa wanele COVID. Ushuti nangu nyago za wama ifiga le mikomu. Sazo kubega na yo ngenje lewe sifele sifele kusizo wenza ngayo. So kundisa kakulu glabo haba sevenzi weze mpilo. Isegi ya glabo futa haba pichaka chaka. Kwenze luguti leli kwa wanele mali ya buwe. Inga li mazika kula bantu. Ngenje lewe nze genga. Ikona nagi mbuzo emi sheti. Uma sektua lelitu wane, kukukukuka futilona, esel pepetega kuluk suwela, 
ulezifunda sezibaliwe ukuthi lokho kusho ukuthi sezofuna kube khona uhlelo olusha yini lokuvala okwenziwa kwezinto emphakathi nje bakade kwenziwa sithi ke cha asizo ushintsha lapho kulezimemezelo ezibekwe umongameli umongameli ushilo ukuthi kunendawo lapho kufana siqinisekise kakhulu ukuthi abantu bahla bahla mabehlangene abaminyana kakhulu ukuthi basebenzise into zokugezi zanja nokuthi basebenzise amamaski lokho sofuna siqhubeke nako kuyonke indawo kunendawo lapho siyamabhisha wavalwe kuzi nyinda wa siyama pishu wa kapi luguti awazi uba ini nkinga ya banda ba isi minya minya kakulu si chayi mklanga nwe mni inge kakulu gazi ena pati uwe zindu udleo mklanga nwe leo kufanta bandu bangu pepa be ikulu magu nga pante kisha umuwa ya kufanta batu kakane batu kukwa nwe nze luguti iko nwe nga nkini kakulu kubwa so zonke lezo zinkelo lezo sizo kubega na za suku kuga su shinja kwa da sizo ba pezu kukuti umas nga kwenza aga kulu kwa nga logo kutuwa skuwa zikulu vigele lili kwa wana si nga kwa zikulu ngoba kwa lona lili ngoba selge la bona gala engila ndi bona gale nende lele nzege nga ayo aligabi libi ka kulu kwa nga kote laso kustrela bale nzi laba kwa nga wase bali kaita nga kwa nga nga kwa zikulu wana lili sili kaita kwa nga legile futu kwa usazu kuti yo ba sesa teko zolo nga maholit umas nga sibuwele ma msebe nzi nga sibuwele ma kaya nga sibuwele hape sifara shere kwa nga ukala wenye hapa ingo zinkuli kude kwa nga kubela pambi nga kwa kwa nga kutu mchame male nyuga manji umas nga uskwaza zamu uti senze yonki ndo kulu viga uti nga kubeki mwaba isa kwa ningo zi uti makalu nyaka futi sazo wenyuga kakulu siya fisa kuti nbe na maholi tamashe kwa ta futi sazo kuti ukuzi pata kwe chukwa nga kwa 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 nga Noma sizo besibuela songe spili. Masiz pateni nge 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 la siba msane uza siri ngobe lili kwa na siya bo. Thank you very much to all the colleagues. Let me then ask Dr. Luazi if you would be in a position to close at this point. Thank you very much to the members of the media and thanks to all South Africans for being with us during this discussion. I will continue to share news as they come along but we believe it's important for us to remain accountable and transparent to uh, the public of South Africa. Thank you very much to all the researchers and all the work that's been done. Thank you very much, Kabazela. Thank you very much to Professor Salim Abdul Karim. Thank you very much uh, to Professor Dolly Vieira and to Prof. Uh, Richard Lessels and uh, to all of the esteemed scientists that have put in this incredible work and we can bring this media briefing to a close. Thank you so much.